Good morning and welcome to this webinar uh, hosted by NQA. My name is Richard Walsh. I'm uh, a predominantly environmental assessor with, with NQA, been employed for uh, eight years with NQA and prior to that had uh, about 12 years in environmental training and consultancy. We're going to be spending the next hour or so looking at the requirements of the new ISO 14,000 and standard. Um, two things that I'd like to say, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. You can ask questions. There is on the right-hand side of your screen, or there should be on the right-hand side of the screen, a box that says chat. If you type any questions into there, I'll be able to see them and we'll answer them. Um, I'll be honest as I see best because sometimes we take them at the time if it's relevant to what I'm talking about, other times we, we, we leave them to the end and that's not a ploy to, to get you all to stay to the very end although I'm sure you will. Um, the other thing is we will be making uh, copies of the presentation available in two formats. You will get a link, oh, so you, you will get a copy of the slides uh, in PDF format, so you'll be able to see all the slides that I'm showing. You will also get uh, a link to our YouTube channel, and on that YouTube channel you will find recordings of not only this webinar, but the other three that I've done as well. So uh, the astute of you may want to go through and see if I've said the same thing in every webinar. Uh, I can assure you, apart from the questions I probably have, but they are all there recorded so you can actually feel a bit like I'm on the BBC iPlayer. You can, you can listen back and uh, enjoy the whole process once again. So that, I think, is the housekeeping out of the way. Um, a brief outline of what we're going to look at. Um, as I say, I'm hoping to speak for about 50 minutes, something like that, 50, 55 minutes. And then if we have any questions at the end uh, or as we go through, we'll, we'll take those. Um, and I am quite prepared. I recognize a few of the names uh, on the attendee list. Um, but this, this goes for everybody, even those people who have not met me before. My email address is Richard. Dot Walsh, that's W-A-L-S-H, at NQA.com, and if anybody later on thinks of a question that maybe they would have liked to have asked but forgot about, or it didn't maybe uh, dawn on you at the time, I don't mind receiving uh, emailed questions uh, a little bit later. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a look at uh, the standard itself, we're going to look at the overarching concepts of the standard, so what does it mean? Uh, just a reminder that this, this presentation is based on the what we call the FDIS, the Final Draft International Standard. We're going to have a look at the rules for interpretation. So, so at the end of the day, we all want to try and interpret it the same way. That's both you and us as the certification body. And then we're also going to go through, and uh, this will take up the main part of the presentation, we'll go through the standard clause by clause. We'll look at the key concepts. So in other words, what what each clause means, what the requirements are, what the audit criteria are, and probably for you, most importantly, to give you some ideas and some thoughts about what we as assessors will, will expect to see. So the objectives, obviously, to be able to describe the new requirements of the ISO 14001 2015 standard. Uh, as I say, it's based on the FDIS, the Final Draft International Standard. Uh, there may be a slight change uh, when the standard is published. That is not likely to be a significant change. In fact, it can't be a significant change. The only changes permitted from now are what we call editorial changes. Um, not quite arguing about full stops and commas, but, but not much more than that. We're going to have a look at what was intended by the authors. Uh, what did they mean? Try to make sure that we all interpret the requirements in a consistent manner look at the evidence that we're likely to see and identify some of the documentation required by the standard and the communication issues. There are some new and modified concepts within the, the standard. Um, you, those of you who may be also working quality management will will see, if, you, if you've looked at the, the, the two FDISs, and I, I will keep using that phrase, um, that the ISO 14001 has no what it calls normative references. So in other words, at the start of the standard, it doesn't talk about, the, the, there are no additional references 
pointed out anywhere else. Everything you need is contained in the standard. But they also, if you look at the annex, which is the bit at the end which then tries to interpret the standard, you will see that Annex A in 14001 is 14 pages long. And that compares to only four pages in ISO 9001. So clearly there is quite a, uh, a number of areas where the standard has felt there needs to be some dif uh, different um, terminology used and sort of the implications of, of that terminology. So um, one of the things the standard is looking at is the management of change. And again, we'll see that change crops up throughout the standard and that is also an important area that we need to we need to think about. Uh, we're also going to have a look at a number of uh, definitions, some terminologies. We're going to look at the areas where the standard gives you as uh, as uh, if you like organizations implementing the standard authority and autonomy. Uh, there is a lot more autonomy within this standard to be able to do things how you want to do them and the standard does define over 30 different terms and concepts and we'll look at some of those uh, now. So Annex Section A3 clarifies some of the terms that are used and some of the terms that we need to have an understanding of so that we don't uh, misinterpret the requirements and that we all have a common approach. We're going to have a look at some of the more important ones, but I do suggest that you take the time out to just have a look at the, uh, them for yourself and uh, understand the definitions. Um, the words appropriate and applicable crop up quite a bit, and they are not interchangeable. Um, appropriate, the way the standard defines it, is suitable for and implies a degree of freedom. So if it says something is appropriate or where appropriate, you um, it means it, it can be used and you have a degree of freedom about whether you actually do that. Applicable means it's relevant or possible and if it can be done then it has to be done. Consider versus take into account. Consider means necessary to think about the topic, so you've got to have a think about it, evaluate it but you don't then have to move forward with it. You can exclude that area if you've considered it. What we would normally expect if you consider something and choose to exclude it, we would perhaps want to see a little bit of rationale as to why that decision was made. And then come, take into account, if it's relevant, uh, you have to think about it, uh, but then, then you can't exclude it. So you've got to, uh, if you like, you have to consider it, but then actually take it into account. You have to uh, incorporate it into, into the system. Those of you who've, who've come across me in the past will know that one of my uh, areas uh, of a little bit of OCD is uh, continual versus continuous. And of course, the standard refers to the term continual. Continual is usually used in, in reference to continual improvement. And I do come across a number of people who claim that it's continuous improvement. The analogy I tend to use is continual is a set of stairs and continuous is a ramp. And the word continual is the appropriate one to use. Um, because you will see, with, as I say, with, with, with a set of stairs, continual improvement, we don't have a linear progression. We tend to move in, in bursts, if you like, with maybe some periods of inactivity. Some other key definitions that are in the standard. Persons doing work under its control, essentially the same as the current standard, but must now reflect the difference between control and influence. Um, we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail, but the standard acknowledges the fact that in certain instances you don't have full control, but you still may retain influence over people doing work on your behalf. That might relate to suppliers particularly. Environmental performance refers to the environmental results that are achieved when the aspects, activities, processes, products, services and systems are managed and controlled. And that's what the standard is all about, improving your organization's environmental performance. Documented information has replaced three terms that are used in the current standard, documentation, documents and records. Uh, they've now come under that one umbrella term, documented information. And again, there's a little bit of sub-definition in here. The standard uses the term retained documentation as evidence of. 
So retain documented information, that means records. Uh, maintain documented information, full stop, without the as evidence of, means items other than records. And then the phrase as evidence of, which is what we said in the first uh, phrase, retain documented information as evidence of, that means it's not a requirement to meet legal, so it's it is not a requirement to meet legal evidence requirements such as waste transfer notes, so it's not holding that type of thing. But for instance, if when we come on to look at the clause on uh, competence, you will see that the standard states that you need to retain documented information as evidence of competence. Now that's not to say there's a legal requirement there, but the standard does require that you hold that. So if there's a little bit of confusion in that. Compliance obligations are the same as legal under the requirements and indeed the standard does allow, if you choose, you can still stick to that term legal under the requirements. It does say that is a valid alternative term. Um, and again, we'll look at those in a short while, but generally there are two types of compliance obligations, mandatory and voluntary, and they quite nicely fit into the legal and other requirements. Intended outcome is what you intend to achieve through the implementation and running of your management system. And then just a final definition, ensure, that word crops up a bit, ensure means that uh, the responsibility can be delegated but not the accountability. That tends to apply mainly to a senior management team and also the word any, as you might expect, gives uh, selection or choice. Not going to go through that slide, you can quite easily read it, that's just a history of where we've come from, um, environmental standards have been around for 23 years now in this country, March 1992 was the launch of the very first standard and you will see the date followed through. One thing that I should have done and I, I, I must admit uh, slapped wrist, I forgot to do that, you'll see the date at the bottom on the very last bullet point. Um, when this presentation was put together a month or two ago, we were expecting a date of the 16th of September. You may have seen, I don't know, the actual date now is the 15th of September. Next Tuesday is the publication of the new standard. That's been confirmed by Martin Baxter from the uh, from AIMA, um, and Martin has led the UK delegation to the committee writing the standard. So next Tuesday is uh, D-Day if you like, that's when the, the new standard will be published and available. That just shows a little bit about the new standard again and the journey that's come through from committee drafts, draft standards, FDIS as, we, as I keep referring to, and as I say for the 16th of September, now read the 15th of September. Just a little bit about uh, our process, um, so we are more or less now where the uh, the third arrow from the left, uh, ISO 14001 2015 issued. Moving forward, um, the the end date if you like, 2018, the, the date in there now will be the 15th of September 2018 and by that date or on that date, all existing 2004 certificates will expire automatically. So if you haven't made the transition and had a, an update visit by the 15th of September 2018, you'll suddenly find yourself high and dry with no certificate. There is this three year transition period and you can choose to make a transition any time during that three year period. Uh, obviously we are ourselves implementing a training program for our own staff and also for yourselves. There will be other training uh, events, um, there are a number of, of roadshows around the country that I'll be uh, appearing at, if that's the right phrase, I shall be speaking at, um, and those are in a, again on our website, you can see the dates of those, they tend to be late afternoon into the evening. With a, with, a, with a spot of tea in between and uh, that's a chance to, to speak to me face to face and also to, to have a look at some of the other, uh, some, some of the requirements of the standard. Not going to go through this too much but the standard, the current standard is uh, 11 years old, it was published in 2004, I think it's fair to say that the world of the environment, uh, certainly related to business, has come a long way in the last 11 years or so. Uh, and the new standard is designed to have a shelf life of about 10 years. 
So it's really setting us up for the remainder of the um, this decade and into the 2020s. But it's there to provide a consistent foundation for business to achieve improvements in, in environmental performance. The other thing that it's done, uh, and there's a, there's a separate webinar I think that you'll be able to, to download referring to Annex SL. Annex SL was the skeletal standard, if you like, uh, that was produced first of all about three years ago now, which was the format for all the new standards. So you will see that the numbering has changed uh, on, on all of the clauses. In fact, on some of the clauses, it is predominantly the numbering that's changed. Uh, and for those of you with uh, integrated systems or that are thinking about integrated systems, the two standards being produced this year, 9001 and 15001, will all be in the format of Annex SL. And indeed, next year, when um, OSAS 18001 becomes ISO 45001, that will also be in, in the same format. And it will make the numbering system particularly, but the whole requirements for integrated standards much, much simpler. The standard uses uh, the well-worn now, uh, what it calls the Deming cycle, plan, do, check, act. Um, and that's been around for quite a while now and as I say all management standards work on, on that same process and that's how the requirements of the standard fit into the plan do check act bit where clauses four to seven are under the planning section clauses one two and three are sort of setting the scene and definitions and things like that so we'll, we'll ignore those clause four is where the standard really starts clauses four five six and seven are planning Clause 8 operation is fits under the do bit. Uh, performance and evaluation is checking and improvement is acting. So that's how it all fits together. And here you'll see, if, if you've not seen it before for the first time perhaps, this is how the new standard is laid out. The bits in black are the bits that are common to all of the standards. So at the moment I saw 9001 there, FDIS reads exactly the same for the bits in black. The bits in green relate to 14001. So on some of the bits in, in green, if, if I was showing you the equivalent quality one, where I'd perhaps show it in blue, then it would say quality management system rather than environmental management system. Uh, but there are some, some, some quite significant differences. Clause 8, for instance, operation is a fairly short section in 14,001. It's about a page long. In 9,001, it's five or six pages. So there's, there are some quite key changes. We're going to go through all of those clauses and have a look at what we mean, or what the standard means, and how we how we'll interpret them and how we can try and make sure that you're all interpreting them in a, in a, in a consistent manner. So the standard goes right the way back to basics, if you like, and, and I suggest that those of you who have an existing standard and are looking at upgrading also go right the way back to here and start um, almost from first principles. And the standard is all about, uh, it starts out by asking you to understand the context of your organisation. So where you sit, what the drivers are, what the internal and external issues are, so you need to determine those. The needs of interested parties, and again we'll have a look at who those interested parties might be. We need to set the scope, and the scope cannot exclude activities, products and services that can have significant aspects. That's fairly similar to, to, to the current standard. And a new requirement, which again we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, is that the scope has to be available as documented information. Currently, you'll probably all be aware that the policy says that uh, that has to be made available to the public as, as, as required. The new standard requires the scope as well. And typically, I would probably expect to see some wording around the scope added to the, to the start of the policy. That would be the easiest way, the tidiest way to, to sort that out. So the standard introduces requirements to consider your organization's context and the need of interested parties or stakeholder concerns. So in other words, who is affected by your impact or your, your, the things you do that can impact the environment? Uh, what are their concerns? How does it impact them? What are their requirements? 
to determine internal and external issues relevant to your purpose and that can affect your liability to achieve or ability not liability so affect your ability to achieve the intended outcome this introduces a slightly new concept because the current standard is really about how our organizations impact the environment what it is that we do that can affect the environment the new standard is very very clear that it's a two-way street it's not just how we impact the environment but we also need to take into consideration how the environment can impact on us and also then what we need to be aware of how we can put in place plans to mitigate some of those issues going through those two bullet points should then result in the EMS itself focusing on issues that present the greatest risk as I said that could be a risk actually not of something of, of us maybe pouring oil down a drain it could be a risk from flooding it could be a risk from climate change that could actually be the greatest risk on us as an organization there can also be positives and negatives and obviously positive risk we see that as opportunity and again the standard requires that you look at those take them into account and if that is an opportunity that is presented that you can grasp that opportunity we tend to expect to see three main areas identified and issues looked at um, not going to read them all out you can read them for yourselves but we're looking for environmental conditions and those are the things I've already talked about and, 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 and a number of others uh, so those are the things that the, where, where the environment can throw things at us uh, there can be external issues other than environmental conditions so the, the maybe the legal regulatory framework in which we have to operate the current economic conditions availability of technologies the social cultural uh, environment uh, in which we sit maybe what our competitors are doing uh, and, and so on and so forth and then internally uh, the strategic direction of the company that's very important and we'll see uh, shortly that the environmental management system has to be compatible now with the strategic direction of the company we can be affected by our capabilities what 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 have we got the capability in-house to do we can be affected by compliance compliance status <coughs> excuse me that can be compliance status externally with legal requirements or compliance status within our own uh, internal management system the culture of our organization the standards to which we operate and so on and so forth however the whole point in this and again this is a, a term that we'll see coming through uh, quite a bit the intent of all of this is to provide a high level conceptual understanding and the words high level are in bold deliberately a high level conceptual understanding of the important issues that can positively or negatively affect the way in which environmental responsibilities are managed no longer can we say uh, in an organization well who looks after environment well it's Fred he's down the corridor third door on the left this whole understanding has to permeate through the organization from from the very very top that's why high level is is involved and there, there is a new clause we'll come on to shortly called leadership and we'll see what that means for the top management or top tier of management within an organization not going to go through this in detail this is just an example that I've lifted uh, don't claim ownership of this uh, this is just giving one area um, of uh, example of context if you like water scarcity the sort of things that you might have to have to look through uh, the process that you have to go through in one fairly small particular area uh, looking at lack of water um, use of water may damage habitats there may be non-governmental organizations campaigning against the company there may not be the technological expertise or there may be the technological expertise but it doesn't have the culture necessary and, and so on and so forth climate change so there's all all host of things that we need to think about interested parties this is all about understanding the needs and expectations of those interested parties and the standard requires that you determine which requirements are relevant now obviously none of us can give everybody everything they're looking for that would be an impossibility however you do have the freedom to decide which needs and expectations become compliance obligations uh, so people may have expectations of you and if you choose to 
accept those obligations and, and work with those people, then they would become compliance obligations. However, as an absolute minimum, the very, very bottom line is, as currently with the standard, the 2004 standard, all relevant legal requirements must be included. That is an area where you have no um, authority or autonomy to change. This is a fairly standard slide, I guess, interested parties, you might want to call them stakeholders if you've been through this type of training before, employees, board members, neighbours, customers, suppliers, contractors, regulators, community pressure groups. To be honest, I could have said just about anybody who has a legitimate interest in the activities of your organisation. So clause 4.3 talks about the scope, and we've already said that the scope has to be made available to interested parties, and I've said that the way I would probably choose to do that if it was me sorting this out would be to, to tag a little bit about the scope as an introduction, a scene setter if you like, for, for the policy statement itself. But the scope is there to clarify the, both the physical and organisational boundaries of the system. So it can include all the organisation, or it can be a part. However, you can't exclude significant environmental aspects or evade compliance obligations by using that. So you couldn't decide to, if you were a factory with one really, really nasty process and then lots of other fairly mundane activities going on, you couldn't actually draw a boundary around the sort of the, uh, the dirty part of the site and say we're going to do everything but that. It, it has to be representative of what you do and the standard is quite clear now that it mustn't be misleading. You can't, you can't just um, take a small part of the site and say, well, we've got 14,001 for, for that little bit there for maybe, I don't know, maintenance activities, and then claim that you've got 14,001 for the whole organisation. And that's something we will be looking at very, very carefully because we obviously have to agree to the scope. The scope is what goes on your certificates. And if we feel that there is an issue that you're trying to pull the wool over somebody's eyes, uh, then we will not allow the scope that you're, you're asking for. So, as I say, it mustn't be misleading. Don't go down that road uh, because you'll not get through a certification visit with ourselves. The system itself, the old standard, asked, uh, the, asked you as organisations to establish a whole range of procedures. And these included things like aspects, legal requirements, management procedure, awareness procedure, communications procedure, document control procedure, operation procedures, emergency preparedness, so on and so forth. There's a whole range of procedures that the standard required. Now, instead of asking organisations to write lots and lots of new procedures, 14,001 2015 expects the maintenance and control of a wide range of documents, i.e. documented information. Now, the standard doesn't say what they have to be called now. It talks about documented information. As I said, the old standard referred to the term procedure. So because the standard doesn't say what they're to be called, you can call them what you like. If you want to call them procedures, you can still call them procedures. If you wanted to stick with what you've got but just tweak them slightly uh, and still call them procedures, work instructions, manuals, you can do that. You have that autonomy. Um, and of course, the standards do still require some documents. I've had people say to me, well, Bill, I understand that we can get away with nothing. Nothing documented whatsoever. That is not the case. So the standard does require documented information. Again, we'll see where that crops up. So whilst on the surface it appears to be a radical change, it probably isn't, other than it allows you a much greater degree of freedom to document things how you would choose to do so. Leadership. Um, in order to ensure that the system is successful, uh, a new clause has been added that assigns specific responsibilities for those in leadership roles. And a key part of that is the promotion of environmental management within the organisation. And it asks for top managers, top or senior management if you like, to accept uh, or to take on this role of leadership uh, by accepting total responsibility for the system itself, demonstrating or showing that they support it, and also providing resources for it. It also expects them to ensure that the policies formulated, objectives are established, 
compliance obligations are acknowledged, environmental aspects and impacts are considered, and that roles, responsibilities and authorities are signed. It defines top management as, and it's inverted commas, so that's a direct lifting from the standard, person or group of people who directs and controls an organisation at the highest level. So if your system covers your entire organisation, there are times I will, or an assessor, keep referring to I, an assessor will want to see the person at the very top. Not necessarily every visit, uh, but certainly I would start to now read into this that at a stage two visit, it would make life very, very difficult if the top management person, the managing director or whatever the name of that person who chairs the board, if you like, uh, if they're not available, life is going to get a little bit difficult because there will need to be some discussion and interaction with that person. But the term top management refers to people who provide the resources and can delegate authority and uh, also the people who coordinate and direct and control the organisation. However, if you do decide legitimately that the, um, the management system will only cover maybe a business unit within your organisation, then top management would only be the senior management of that business unit. So if you were uh, maybe a, a company with maybe five sites around the UK and you chose to have the boundaries of your EMS at just one of your sites, but including all the activities at that site, then the top manager would be the person who has the direct control of that site, so the senior manager of that business unit. But it does require top management to take accountability for the effectiveness of the standard. Uh, the system rather. Now what this slide shows is the differences between the current responsibilities in the 2004 standard and the 2015 responsibilities as uh, the new standard. As you can see there's quite a difference, there's twice as many in the, in the right hand column, so currently responsibilities are for establishing the policy, appointing a management representative and undertaking periodic reviews of the AMS. Now interestingly the new standard has dropped the term management representative. Now that's not to say that those of you who have that role within your organisations need to go out and start looking for another job, far from it. The requirements or the, the responsibilities of that role are still there. All it says is now that you don't have to have a named representative. If you wish to do so, then again you have the autonomy, the freedom to do that but the standard does no longer require a, an appointed management representative. It does require the, the rules uh, as detailed on the right hand side, so communicating the importance of environmental management around the system, uh, around the company rather, and uh, the importance of conforming to the system's requirements, directing and supporting staff to allow them to contribute, supporting other management roles, promotion of continual improvement, ensuring that objectives are established and provision of resources. That's all in there, but as you can see, it's a slightly wider responsibility than current. So the policy itself, policy is defined as a commitment, a direction or intention, and is a statement from the top management of an organization. It makes a commitment to a number of things. Um, has to be appropriate to the scale, the nature and the environmental impact of a company's activities, products and services. And these are the things that we need to see in there now. It needs to set a framework for environmental objectives, that's in the current standard. It has to be documented and available to interested parties, no change there. It has to be communicated internally, no change there. The big change is that there are now three main commitments uh, environmentally that come under one umbrella really. Um, there is this commitment to protect the environment and that's an area that's caused a little bit of questioning, certainly of me when I've been out assessing at the moment, what do we mean by protection of the environment, what are we going to see and again we'll, we'll have a look at that shortly. Another commitment is to fulfil the organisation's compliance obligations, both voluntary and mandatory and also to continually improve the EMS to enhance environmental performance. 
and it's interesting that it now states that the EMS itself has to be improved. I visit clients mentioning no names where basically the system hasn't changed, certainly in the eight years of time being with NQA. It's more or less the same system and one or two bits have moved along, maybe some objectives and targets have changed, uh, monitoring and measurement has, has, has changed slightly, but the system itself has remained the same, and some procedures, some elements of the system can be seven or eight years old, see that from the dates of issue. That's not going to be permissible. You do need to continually improve the system as well as your in, uh, environmental performance, and that's one of the things we will be looking for. So this new section, this umbrella phrase, protection of the environment, what does it mean? I've had people say to me, does that mean I'm going to start nailing bird boxes all around my site and sowing wildflower meadows out on the front lawn and things like that? Do that if you want. Uh, that would be possibly relevant, but it's a lot more than just uh, that type of thing. So protection of the environment does include the current terminology, which is prevention of pollution but it includes a lot of other things as well. Um, so the, the things that we would start to expect to see in there are things like sustainable resource use, climate change mitigation if that's relevant, protection of biodiversity and ecosystems, uh, water quality, air quality. It's all about being uh, proactive rather than reactive in terms of managing how you impact on the environment and how the environment can impact upon yourself. So it is, as I say, a lot more um, being upfront, uh, taking things into account and designing the system around these, these particular areas. However, we will need to see commitments over and above prevention of pollution. So if it still just says, if the policy that you've got still just says prevention of pollution, that will not be deemed acceptable. We will need to see some additional um, parts, uh, issues uh, committed to, some additional commitments. Okay, moving on to clause 5.3, roles, resources, responsibilities and authorities and resources are pinched from clause 7.1. That comes slightly later in the standard, but I feel it still sits better in here. So this is all about uh, deciding who's going to do what, how they're going to do it, and what resources are they going to be given. Um, resources have to be assigned and communicated within the organisation. Uh, things can be done by an individual. As we said, there's no formal requirement for management representative, but uh, it can be done collectively or individually, your choice. Um, the standard sets out two key roles, uh, and they must be assigned either to an individual or shared by a group, but must be ultimately carried out by top management, and that's ensuring that the system conforms to the requirements of ISO 14001, and then reporting on performance of the system and environmental performance to top management. And then top management have to ensure that the system is fully resourced and that can include HR resources, infrastructure, technology, financial resources, and above all, time. That's probably the biggest issue when I speak to people. It's people are not being given time to do what they need to do. So that's the end of Clause 5. Uh, clause 6 is now this section called Action to Address Risks and Opportunities. And it's all about addressing the issues that you identified earlier on in clauses 4, 1 and 4, 2, which was all about the context of the organisation and the needs of interested parties. Um, so it's about planning to address these issues so that we can achieve our intended outcomes, and those intended outcomes are to enhance environmental performance, to fulfil our compliance obligations and achieve our environmental objectives. It's about reducing undesired effects. Uh, and a part of that is significant environmental impact, so that's fairly similar to what we've got in place now, but also to take into account, as I keep stressing, environmental conditions that can affect the organisation. So the standard requires that your organisations are able to achieve the intended outcome of the system, first of all, and the whole, the whole outcome of the system is to enhance environmental performance, 
and to do that we need to prevent or reduce undesired effects, achieve continual improvement um, and make sure that that continual improvement is both in our environmental performance and in the system itself. So what does risk mean in the new standard? So we expect an organisation to determine and address issues because the risk it can pose is important or significant. So it's slightly more than looking at how you impact on the environment. So it could be, as I've said a number of times now, a risk could be identified because of something that the environment might throw at you rather than something you might be throwing at the environment. And you need to determine what the risk is and then address, address that risk. And obviously risk, uh, risk being the uncertainty of a potential effect on objectives and the action taken is to gain more knowledge and reduce that uncertainty. So it's a little bit of research. What is the risk? How does it affect us? And then how can we reduce that uncertainty by putting better controls into place, better plans uh, and working out how we're going to deal with it. And this is all about addressing that effect or, or impact on us. And it's to take action to reduce the negative effects and also to leverage positive effects both on ourselves and on the wider environment. As with the current standard, we then need to prioritise these issues. So it's all about looking at uh, the significant risks. Um, standard still does call them significant aspects. Um, risks, acceptable terminology. So we're looking at prioritising these issues, taking into account things like the compliance obligations, um, we're looking at uh, the uh, other issues that can have an effect on our environment, uh, or as I say, that we can affect the environment with, and the prioritisation has to be based on the achievement of the intended outcome, so can we achieve it? The prevention of adverse effects, so how successful will it be in uh, moving forward in, in preventing those identified adverse effects and making sure that we achieve continual improvement. Now the standard does not say that there is a requirement for a documented risk management process. Obviously there does need to be a way of doing it uh, and I've seen, I can assure you, the most complex Excel spreadsheets uh, with all sorts of weighting factors and other nonsense in there uh, that take us through this whole process. And I think I think one particular company I went to there, uh, numbering system produced uh, anywhere between one and a hundred thousand. Well, that was a nonsense. It doesn't require that at all. Uh, it's entirely up to you how you do this process. The there's, you know, I don't want to hear anybody saying to me, well, the standard says we've got to do this. That is not the case. So the big change in this particular area of the standard in environmental aspects is that the standard now requires us to move towards using a life cycle perspective. So we have to take into account new or modified activities, products and services, planned or new developments. We have to take into account abnormal and reasonably foreseeable emergency situations. Most people already have taken those into account. People will have normal, abnormal and emergency situations shown on their uh, evaluation documentation. The standard now says that that has to be done. Um, this activity needs to cover, as I keep stressing, adverse and beneficial impacts. We need to communicate the results of this appropriately and document the method used for the communication, not the document, not documenting how we've done the risk assessment. And as I've said, use a life cycle perspective. That doesn't mean a full life cycle assessment. However, we have to acknowledge that we have upstream aspects as well as downstream aspects. So upstream aspects could be raw materials, where the raw materials have come from, the fact that they've been transported to us, maybe supplier or some contract processes that happen outside of our, our own organisation, as well as the usual downstream aspects, delivery, use, disposal, pollution, that type of thing. So we need to look, again, it's a two-way street, we need to look up the street as well as down the street. 
compliance obligations hasn't really changed. Uh, the terminology has changed, uh, although the standard does allow, as I said earlier, legal and other requirements to still be used. Uh, and the standard requires, uh, which is very similar to the current clause 4.2, uh, sorry, in clause 4.2, rather very similar to the clause 4.3.2, that you determine and have access to relevant compliance obligations. You need to determine how they apply to your organisation and take them into account within the system. And obviously a compliance obligation can result in a risk. However, whilst the standard does allow the use of risk management techniques, they cannot be applied here. So in other words, there is no, it is not acceptable to allow the risk of non-compliance. That is not a permitted risk term that can be used. Um, however, there is a much greater part now on uh, this term, other requirements. So uh, the standard tends to call them voluntary obligations. And I've seen legal registers with a very, very small amount of legislation listed. I was at a company a couple of weeks ago, reasonably sized company, and they presented me with a legal register. This was a stage one visit. The legal register had eight things on it and no other requirements listed at all. And that is clearly not acceptable. Uh, and I've seen people say there are no other requirements. Now that, that I would say is not true. So it will no longer be acceptable providing that you've understood the context of your own organisation and that's been properly evaluated as required. There will be compliance obligations that are not legislatively based. And the absence, and this is just something that I'm saying but I think this is how we will work within NQA, one of the little tricks if you like, the absence of any voluntary uh, obligations or other requirements will say to us that you've not understood the context of your organization fully and is likely to result in significant findings as a part of the process. Oops, I think I've moved that too far, there we go. Planning action, so this is all about now having identified what uh, those significant risks are, positive and negative, you then need to start to plan on addressing them. So plan on how the actions are going to be integrated into the system and other business processes. So the EMS is not a ring-fenced activity within the business. The EMS must be complementary to and incorporated into the wider business practices of the organization. So you need to think about how the objectives, how the plans are going to be built in, you need to think about how you're going to evaluate the effectiveness of them and that can include considering technological options, financial and business requirements. And this section itself deals with how you plan to take action and it's not the detailed planning action itself. This is all about uh, the actual planning, objectives and planning to achieve them. So the previous slide looked at planning to take action. This is now using the tools that the standard requires to make sure that we set objectives and plan to achieve them. You'll notice the word target has been removed. The term objectives and targets has gone. It is now objectives and planning to achieve them. And uh, the standard defines objective as a result to be achieved. It's still a target, but they've actually taken out the, the, the English word target. Objectives can be strategic, tactical, or operational, and can apply to the organization as a whole, or to a particular system, process, project, product, or service. If you still want to refer to them as targets, aims, goals, or intended outcomes, then feel free to do so. The standard says that significant aspects must be taken into account when setting objectives. And remember, taken into account, defined as necessary to think about what cannot be excluded. So if we see objectives that don't have a connection back to some of your significant aspects, and that does occur sometimes, that will no longer be acceptable. So moving on now to clause 7. From here onwards, and I'm conscious it's 10 to 11, and we're a little bit behind, so I will apologize if we go five, five minutes over at the end, 
we haven't got any questions yet I will just remind you if you do have any questions you can type them in the box uh, an absence means you're either all asleep or I'm doing very well in answering everything that you were hoping to hear I hope it's the latter uh, but we'll keep going if I get any questions fine if not I shall just keep going right to the very end and remember you can always email me uh, richard.walsh at nqa.com if you have any questions at a later date but the clauses from here on in are more aligned to the existing standard and uh, in some cases the main change is numbering so competency this is very very similar to the existing uh, clause it's necessary to determine competency requirements so if we're asking people to do jobs within the system we need to determine what those competency requirements are and these are areas that need to be documented we need to ensure that people are competent and they can be competent on the basis of education training or experience doesn't have to be that you can wave a raft of certificates around uh, it can be competent just on experience if it was competence on certificates I wouldn't be sat here now uh, my competence is predominantly 20 years nearly in, in, in this industry however where it's deemed necessary to take action to allow staff to acquire that competence that, that must be permitted and then evaluate the effectiveness of that <coughs> oh, excuse me so that could include allowing training it could be mentoring uh, reassigning staff or the use of additional resources additional staff if required however the annex of the standard lists a number of areas where there will need to be detailed competency requirements and those are the people who carry out the aspect evaluation who can contribute to the achievement of objectives people who respond to emergency situations so it may be that you may have a, um, a spill response team uh, people who carry out internal auditing and people who carry out the evaluation of compliance so as an absolute minimum we will expect to see competency records maintained and requirements set for those five rules and as I say those are detailed in the annex of the standard <coughs> Clause 73 on awareness is very, very similar to the existing standard. Minimal change uh, applies to contractors, subcontractors who have who've been identified right away at the start of the process under evaluation of the context of the organisation. But these people need to be aware of the policy and the commitments that you as an organisation have made. They need to understand the significant aspects and potential impacts of their work how they can contribute to the effectiveness of your system and the benefits of improving environmental performance and the implications or risks of them not conforming to your EMS requirements and as I say this applies to all contractors and subcontractors that you identified at the start and if I'm being honest it's a little bit more than just saying well we've given them a copy of the policy um, got one question which I will take just now how would one demonstrate the competence of senior management who may be well experienced to run the business but have little understanding of environmental management that's a very very good question um, it's most most top managers are quite capable of understanding uh, the world in which they sit they are understanding the uh, the requirements uh, of, of legislation uh, and are able to to actually move forward and and take on this role obviously there needs to be support um, and whilst there is no requirement for management representative anymore there is still the requirement for that function to be to be in place and part of that function is to support top management um, what we intend to do will be to talk to senior management and, 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 and evaluate ourselves their understanding of the system and don't forget this is a journey we're not expecting people from day one to be to be the fount of all knowledge um, it may be that uh, they can attend uh, you know training Tr training is an option it's not the only option but uh, there are we, we run training courses for um, 
on introductions to, to the environment and, and, and management systems. Um, but generally, I feel that certainly most organisations I've visited, top management with support from staff at low levels can actually provide that competence. But as far as we're concerned in terms of an evaluation, it will be done through uh, a face-to-face -face interview. I'll take the second question as well um, about BSA 555. Um, will that be rewritten so it's consistent with 14,001 2015 and is there any time scale? I've not seen anything pertinent to BSA 555 itself. I've seen uh, some, I think it was on, on Twitter of all places, from Martin Baxter, things related to uh, ISO 14005, which is also a phased approach to uh, the implementation of a management system. And I believe that that is targeted to be updated within the next 18 months to two years. But certainly for BSA 555 as it stands, I've not seen anything at the moment. We have a number of certificates in place. BSA 555, if I'm honest, actually has some requirements in there that are relevant to the new standard anyway. The use of performance indicators, for instance, is, is something we'll come on to. So I'm not anticipating any great change straight away. Uh, I'll move on. Any other questions? Again, keep firing them at me. Uh, I will apologise for the timing, um, but I'll keep, keep bashing on. I understand if anybody needs to leave, but I will, I will keep going. Communication, again, similar to the current standard, two tiers of communication, internal and external. The standard, however, does state that communication has to be transparent, appropriate, so it meets the needs of relevant parties, truthful and not misleading. I'm sure none of you uh, are anything other than that. Mustn't exclude relevant information and be understandable to the relevant parties. So if you are asked to provide information to a residence group on, say, stack emissions, it's no good sending them the most complex Excel spreadsheets that they wouldn't have a clue to understand. It has to be tailored to the audience for which the communication is, is aimed at. Um, some details on what the standard is asking for. This is, these are areas taken from the standard. So internally, communicating the importance of effective environmental management and conforming to the uh, EMS requirements, responsibilities for the roles within the system, system performance to top management, uh, communication of the policy and the environmental objectives. And externally, um, environmental requirements to external providers and users, uh, information as required by compliance obligations to interested parties, that might be uh, information on effluent discharges to your local water company, could be information to the environment agency, communication of significant environmental aspects if you deem it relevant, communicating the policy and the scope, that's mandatory, and responses to relevant incoming communication regarding the system. So if somebody writes asking a question, then you need to respond to that. Documented information, there is a key change. The main difference is that you only require documentation to be held, and I quote now, in a manner sufficient to demonstrate a suitable, adequate and effective EMS. Your choice. I don't want to hear people saying, well, the standard said I have to do it like this. The standard doesn't. The standard just says what I've just said there. We're not looking for a complex, all singing, all dancing document control system. We require, we need to see the documents that you've decided that you need and the odd bits that the standard requires. Um, you can have them in whatever form you want. It doesn't have to be in the form of a manual. You can have a manual if you want, but they can be free form. You can be in flow charts. They can be... Uh, whatever you want, really. Uh, but however they are presented, they need to be controlled, available as required, and protected. And again, I'm not going to go through this, uh, but for your information, these, this is just pulled out all the areas where the standard currently says we have to have documented information. Now, I've used the old terminology, documents and records, to show the differences. But actually, the standard now calls it all documented information. But if you want to use documents and records, you still can. And that's what we will expect to see as a minimum. Things that are no longer required is a requirement to fully document the EMS. You can choose to document what you want. There are no targets. You don't have to document roles, resources, responsive, sorry, roles responsibilities, and authorities. Uh, they have to be communicated, though. 
Now, if I'm being honest, there you would probably document them in order to communicate them, but it's, there isn't a formal requirement, and you no longer have to describe the EMS elements. That used to be done probably in the EMS manual itself, uh, where that document would then act as a signposting to, to other parts of the system. There is no longer this requirement to communicate externally or to decide whether to communicate externally regarding significant aspects. You can still decide and you have the freedom to decide but it's not uh, something that has to be documented anymore and as we'll see shortly preventive action as a terminology has also disappeared. Operations, planning and control, this is about planning how we're going to meet the requirements of the standard and to plan to meet the actions that we identified in 6.1 and 6.2 which are actions to address risks and opportunities. So this now is setting up operational controls to manage our significant aspects, our compliance obligations, manage the achievement of our objectives and any other risks and opportunities that we uh, take into account and also to manage our outsourced processes dependent upon the level of control or influence that we may have. Another key area that we're looking for now, and this is inherent within the standard, is that planned changes are now controlled using the AMS in order to have mitigate adverse effects and to take into account the effects of unintended changes. So what we're looking for, if, if you decide, I don't know, that you're going to build a whole new warehouse uh, on an adjacent piece of land, we would expect to see environmental considerations taken into account from day one and also that the, um, the planning of that is done with reference to the environmental management system and the system is used to ensure that the planning of that activity is, is managed effectively. And obviously as I said earlier one of the key changes in the standard is this life cycle perspective. So it's to ensure that you establish controls in maybe design and development to ensure that requirements pertinent to the life cycle of your product are addressed, to determine environmental requirements for procurement. Yes, it does include procurement. So those of you with a quality system that have uh, a purchasing process, I will expect to see that purchasing process now reflecting environmental considerations. Communicate relevant requirements to external providers and this for instance may be the reason there's next asterisk there, this may be how you get customer compliance obligations. Your customers may decide we require this from you and that might be that you've got to have ISO 14001, that's maybe a tool that you choose to use. But you need to communicate to external providers your requirements. You need to monitor and measure the results, use documentation as required to ensure that the controls are effective and also consider the potential impact information looking at transport, delivery, use, end of life, etc. So it's a, almost a 360 degree valuation of, of what it is that you're doing and outsource processes are key to that. They are within the scope of the system and we do accept as the bottom bullet point says that your levels of influence may vary. We accept that you cannot necessarily, if you are a small business uh, and you have a very, very large multinational supplier, your level of influence is going to be fairly small. However, we do expect you to uh, understand that and we'll take that into account. Emergency preparedness and response, identical to the existing standard. Um, so I'm not going to go through any anything of that other than a change of number, uh, it is basically the same. Key things in there, uh, responding to, to actual situations, mitigating uh, potential situations, evaluating after something's happened and revising the process as appropriate, uh, periodic testing and obviously maintaining documented information. Right, there's a few questions coming through now, so uh, I will go on. We are going to end up going seriously over time, I do apologise on that, uh, however, um, I'll let you know when I've got to the end of the presentation, but 
and and then I'll uh, that'll be about another two or three minutes, and then we'll look at the questions. Performance evaluation: you need to monitor, measure, and analyze and evaluate your environmental performance, including the performance of the system itself. You need to decide what you're going to monitor. How are you going to monitor it? What indicators are you going to use? And that's the first time 14,001 has mentioned indicators. 8555 has used those right the way back from 2003. When you're going to monitor something, how are you going to evaluate, analyze uh, when you're going to do that? You need to communicate the results of the performance evaluation and again retain appropriate documentation. Evaluation of compliance, again, similar to the current uh, standard. Uh, evaluate conformity with compliance obligations. Those are the, those are the voluntary and the uh, mandatory compliance evaluations. And again, various things you can do. You can, uh, you can use audits. You can do document reviews, site tours, routine day-to-day -day walk rounds need to decide who's suitable to do this, maintain knowledge of your uh, compliance status, so in other words, are we compliant, retain records for that. And interestingly, as far as we're concerned, if you have identified a non-compliance yourselves, sorted it out, corrected it, put the required actions into place within the system, that will not result in a non-conformance and the system also, the standard doesn't require that to be a non-conformance because obviously that is the standard, so that is the system doing what it's supposed to do. But one thing I wish to say, and I say this in a number of occasions, evaluation of compliance is not updating the legal register. That is a different clause. I have people who think that evaluating compliance is simply updating the register on an annual basis. Internal audits as we are now, uh, other than a change of numbering, uh, establish an audit program, considering the environmental importance of the areas that you're auditing, uh, any changes that may have occurred and the results of previous audits. So not a lot of change in the internal audit process. There's obviously different ways you can audit. You can do process auditing. So, for instance, you may have a particular manufacturing process. You might have a quality system in place as well. Those are the quality systems will be used to process auditing. One of the things you could end up doing with the process auditing is auditing, say, that particular process. You might have, I don't know, um, let's say powder coating paint process. You might audit that entire process from a quality environmental and health and safety perspective in one audit uh, and that is completely acceptable. You can still audit by procedure as well and remember you need to audit site processes and things that you may do if you have on-site activities where you may be going out and uh, maybe installing things. Uh, management review again hasn't changed. The concept is top management review the system to ensure continuing suitability, adequacy and effectiveness. And other than some changes in terminology, the inputs and outputs are more or less the same as, as they are now. And I show them there just so that uh, you can see what they are. Doesn't have to be done all in one go. Doesn't have to be a meeting. Remember, it's a process. Most people I see talking about management review meeting. Doesn't have to be, as I say, it's a process, not a meeting. Uh, but there are defined inputs and outputs. And finally, non-conformity is corrective and preventive action. Uh, standard covers non-conformances and corrective action, but there is no reference to preventive action now. So corrective action is now defined as action to eliminate the cause of a non-conformity and to prevent recurrence. I always used to think of preventive action of if you've had something happen, the short-term corrective action is putting it right and then preventive action is stop it happening again. That is now longer-term corrective action. Preventive action is stopping something happening in the first place and is covered in clauses 6.1 and 8.1. So basically, again, we require a graded approach. So in other words, the uh, actions taken have to be appropriate to the magnitude of the effect. And again, we're expecting to see documented information, the nature of the non-conformity, actions taken, and what those results are. And finally, uh, this section called improvement. Uh, and as I say, continual improvement is, 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 is as I say, all about, runs through the whole standard. And I will remind you again 
that we expect to see continual improvement in the system itself. Finally, a quote from Martin Hockaday. Some of you may have met Martin. Martin is our uh, environment sector manager. He wrote a, uh, contributed to an article in Environmentalist magazine back in June. Um, and I quote, assessing how organizations could be affected by the environment is very different from looking at how its operations affect the environment and will require assessors to have a deeper understanding about the organization, its products, services, supply chains, etc. That's a slide I use when I'm talking to our own staff, but it's equally important to yourselves. You also need to understand uh, your own organization, products, services, supply chains, etc. And as I say, it is it is as much about how you are affected by the environment as how your organizations can affect the environments. Right, uh, moving on, right, let's just see where we've got on these questions now. Um, somebody's put, uh, I think it was part of uh, an existing question with, um, no need for a designated management representative, isn't there a risk of losing control and structure of the system? Wouldn't it be best to adopt and maintain the current structure of the compliance system? If that is what you choose to do, you can do that. As I've said, there is a huge amount of autonomy in this. Uh, if you wish to keep your existing structure and existing layout of the system, you can do that. There is no reason for change if you don't want. But if you choose to, you have a huge amount of autonomy to do things how you want. So some companies I do know are going to go back to first principles and sort of evaluate how the whole thing's set up. Other people are going to take what they've already got that's working very successfully and just uh, change the relevant bits that need to be changed. So it's entirely up to you. And yes, there could be a risk of losing control and structure if, if it's not managed in the correct way. And if you worry that that is a risk, then stick with what you've got, but just make sure what you've got meets the requirements of the standard. Um, when is the earliest an organization can be audited against a new standard? Right, I will just answer that now because we've already carried one out. Um, I won't say who they are because um, there is a... Um, the certificate presentation will be next Tuesday on the day that the standard is published. We can currently audit people against the FDIS, which is what we've done. Um, there, it's a two-stage process that we have to go through. Any certificates we currently issue against the new standard will be unaccredited. Uh, we're accredited by UCAS to offer certification. But in order to do that, we have to go through a number of hoops that UCAS insists we do. And at the moment, we are accredited to 14,001 at 2004, not the new standard. That will be taking place in November. And therefore, uh, any, st any certificates we issue in the next sort of couple of months will not have the UCAS tick box on there. It does mean they are slightly less recognized, if I'm being honest. However, as I say, we do have one company who's been through the process. Now, there's an important point I want to make here. That company ended up with a major non-conformance. We treat that upgrade predominantly like a stage two. So therefore, at a stage two assessment, we, we require you to have fully audited the system. And that organization hadn't done that. Uh, it's very, very clear is, is, is the internal auditing clause. It says that you have to audit to ensure that the system is effectively implemented and maintained. So if you haven't carried out a full audit against the new standard, that will, <coughs> excuse me, that will result in a major nonconformance. However, you can be audited as soon as you are ready, um, if I'm honest. That's the questions I've got. I apologize that it's gone to 12 minutes past uh, 11, uh, but I think it was worthwhile doing that. Um, don't think there's any more questions coming through. So I'll thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. Apologies for going over. Uh, notice a couple of people have obviously had to, to shoot off. Um, don't forget that you will be sent a link to our YouTube channel where you can listen to the whole thing again and indeed listen to the three other similar presentations I've done and you will get a PDF copy of the presentation itself. Thank you very much. Um, don't apologize, it was very useful. That's fine, it's nice. Um, those of you that know me will know I like the sound of my own voice too much sometimes. But thanks a lot. 
don't forget any questions you can email me richard.walsh at nqa.com and I recognise a few names on the on the attendance list so uh, but thanks everybody for attending and I'll hopefully see some of you out there in the not too distant future. Thanks a lot and have uh, a good rest of the day.